What is happening, team? Coach Ishak with Hawkfit Coaching and Legion Athletics, and your host for today's episode of Anabolic Radio. I'm joined today by Dr. Bill Campbell from USF. And if you're unfamiliar with uh, Dr. Campbell, he was previously on for an episode where we spoke about diet breaks, refeeds, and some studies he had going on at the time. And, um, you know, being that I'm, I'm in my uh, 2022 contest prep, it's interesting having to had experienced uh, a lot of these adaptive mechanisms in which, you know, oftentimes, you know, being dynamic with our approach is uh, the best way to manage things as you continue to diet down. And um, uh, Dr. Campbell... With uh, without uh, further ado, how are you doing today? And um, how's uh, how's things at USF with regards to some of the studies you guys have going on, or some potential projects you have in the works? So things are going well here. I'm actually in my office. It is raining outside. Typically in Florida, you get well. You were here recently, so you get about yes. one pretty hard thunder shower every day for about 20 minutes. And then sun comes back out. So we're, we're, we're in the middle of that. Um, research is, let me see, we've, we've finished. I'm in the middle of two things. I go up. I'm in the middle of one thing and we're, we're in the process of starting another. So you're a Legion supplement guy. Is that right? Yes. So we are testing one of their fat burning supplements, their Phoenix supplement. And we're looking at its effects on increasing the acute increase in resting metabolic rate, resting energy expenditure. So we are comparing their caffeinated versus a non-caffeinated version and then comparing those two against the placebo. And we're about half done with that study. We should be finishing that probably by November of this year. Data collection is complete. No, uh, we're about half done with data collection. We we paused for the summer. Uh, I have a, a leadership transition on my research team. So Kara Phillips was my research coordinator. I don't think you got to meet any of my my uh, my team when you were here. Um, and now Corey uh, Wisniewski will be, uh, no, Corey will be taking over that role and finishing the the study. And then the other thing that we're doing is I have an, another research leader, Lexa Ruxtella, the, me, her, and Corey. So my two research coordinators, we are initiating a systematic review and meta-analysis on concurrent training. But instead of looking at it the way that most people have, which is does, does cardio, when you add it to resistance training, does it interfere with anabolic adaptations? Does it lessen your muscle mass? What we're doing is looking at it from a fat loss perspective. So how much fat can you lose from resistance training alone? How much fat loss can you anticipate from cardio? And then when you combine them, what is the expected amount of body fat loss? Mm, mm. Man, tons of amazing uh, projects you have going on. I think it's great how you sort of have like have uh, like this leadership system where you know you foster your students and you sort of you know show them how to go about you know doing the process of data collection and um, just you know being able to create a super collaborative effort to bring the whole project together. Now, are you able to reveal any uh, any of the findings on some of these studies that you've been working on? Not the Phoenix study. I have not analyzed any of that data yet. Um, we'll we'll probably get through. I think we finished fourteen subjects so far. We 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 will probably do a blind analysis of the data where I'll send it off to my data analyst and they will do an. And again, it's double blinded, so I don't know what supplements what, and and we'll just see. Do we need to continue with the study after we get about twenty subjects? Um, is there one that's clearly more that that's re, um, elevating metabolic rate more than the others? But short of that, um, we'll just go to 30 subjects and then see what we have. So again, 
no data to present on that. I can talk a little bit about, we did a protein tracking study. Um, we finished that in, uh, I think December, and I'm slowly working on the data set for analysis there. So what we did in that study was we, we took non-resistance trained females and we put them into three groups. And this was a protein intake study. The, the one group, the control group, we said, don't do anything um, different with your diet, but we do want you to start a resistance training program. And it was three days per week. So all of the subjects in the study, they all lifted in my lab. We supervised their workouts for three days per week. And the control group, we said, don't change anything about your diet. Another group, we said, we're going to teach you how to track your macros. And we want you to increase your protein to a gram per pound of body weight or 2.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. And this was going to be through the traditional like flexible dieting, tracking your macro approach. Then the third group of females, we said, we also want you to increase your protein. In fact, we'd like you to double your current protein intake, but we don't want you to track it. We want you to do it intuitively. So just in the way that we coached them was, instead of writing it down, if you normally have like two eggs for breakfast, have four eggs. If you normally have chicken with your salad, double the amount of chicken. So we identified their highest protein foods and we instructed them to double their portion sizes or double the frequency. Let's say they had fish once a week. We said, eat fish twice per week. So we worked with them on that. And the reason we did this was, one, we want to find out if, if there is an increase in, if, if, if increasing protein in a non-resistance trained population, does that result in an increase in muscle mass? And then secondarily, if there is an increase in protein, is it better to track it or can you do it intuitively? Now, we have not analyzed the data yet. We presented some of the data at the International Society of Sport Nutrition Conference a few weeks ago, but we don't have a, we've not analyzed the full data set yet. Mm. Mm, that sounds really interesting. And I'm sure uh, you're familiar with uh, Dr. Jose Antonio's protein overfeeding study. Um, yeah. So I'm interested to see the, the results on that. And um, it's interesting that you took an ad lib approach to increase protein amounts as opposed to tracking it. Is there a specific reason as to why? Yeah, so the reason really was to to serve coaches, because if if you're a like you, you're you're a high level coach. And if you're working with somebody that's just initiating their fitness journey. I'm not an exercise psychologist or behavior psychologist, but I, I believe it's true. You don't want to create 20 new habits for somebody, just mm. do small changes in their lifestyle at a time. So if you're working with somebody as a coach and they're new to fitness, just starting a resistance training program is huge. So what, what we're really asking is, do you also need to teach them how to track their macros to maximize their adaptations from a new resistance training program? Or can you just, can you tell them, hey, just try to get more protein. Don't worry about tracking. We'll, you know, we'll worry about that later. So that was the reason why we designed the study. It's really, um, it's really meant to serve coaches in, in our space. And what we found, the data, I can share some of the data. We found that at baseline, subjects were eating about one gram, maybe 1.1 grams per kg of protein. When we told the subjects to track their protein intake, they were able to get it to two, I think about two grams per kg. So not quite 2.2, so a little less than one gram per pound. And then the other group that we said, just increase your food naturally, intuitively they were able to increase it to only about 1.4 grams per kg. So what we learned in this study was if you're going to get to the higher levels, even a threshold of, one, let's say, 1.6 grams per kg, our data would suggest that you really need to develop the skill of tracking, at least initially, and not rely on their intuitive approach 
to increasing protein. They simply won't get a lo- uh, as much as if they're tracking and they set a daily goal. Mm. Mm. That's a great point. That's a great point. And um, it reminds me of this song by this rapper named Meek Mill, and it goes by levels, right? So it's all about levels, especially, um, you know, as a general population person coming into this, you know, you have to have those realistic expectations in place and you're not going to be an expert macro tracker overnight and, you know, nutrient timing and MPS and you could get confused with all these different things. So it's important to start with your lowest hanging fruit. And then once you've developed the skill of being competent and proficient with that low hanging fruit, you could then graduate to, you know, these different variables to optimize your nutrition or your training in order to maximize your rate of adaptation. Um, So those are all great points. And, um, you know, with us on the topic of some studies you have going on, I know that you've had this uh, project in the works and um, I'd love to hear more about it and um, your your thought process behind it and um, your mission with it. Yeah, so I've I've recently launched a research review. It's called Body by Science. And essentially what it is, it's a summary of the sometimes the newest, but sometimes a the historical landmark studies that have changed the way that coaches coach their athletes or the way that serious fitness enthusiasts approach their training or their own nutrition. So I don't limit it to just the most recent studies. I'm trying to summarize the the best science ever done in the physique enhancement literature. So it's called Body by Science. And the what it what who it seeks to serve is anybody trying to optimize their physique within a maintainable lifestyle. So let me just give a, a quick overview of, of what's in it and where I think the best value of, of the, the publication is. It's, it's a monthly digital product. And each month I summarize two research studies. They're always focused on fat loss or muscle hypertrophy. So it's all about getting lean, getting jacked, getting ripped, that kind of focus. So two studies per month. I summarize them. I kind of give my impression of the design of the study. And then in addition to that, I bring in experts like elite physique coaches, physicians, other researchers, dietitians, And I ask them, or I, I present it like this. You just saw, or you just read my summary of this study help us to apply this or give us some strategies of how you would apply this research into the lives of your clients. Or again, if, if, they're, a, if they're a fitness enthusiast themselves, help us apply it. Because what I've learned is if you just read research and that's all you do, and you just try to carbon copy that into the lives of your clients, you're not gonna be an effective coach. The true value of being a great coach is letting the evidence, the science guide you, and then molding that research, those results, into the lifestyles of your clients so that they would actually follow it. So that's what I'm doing. I'm bringing the experts in to apply the findings. And then one last thing Mm. I want to say, you don't have to be a scientific savant. You don't have to be an expert. You don't even know have to know how to read research. That's my job. My job is to break it down so that you can understand what the study was, how it was conducted, the strengths and weaknesses of the study. And then the most important part is, what did they find? And now, how should this impact us? How should we change our training based on this? How should we change our dieting? Or should we should we take a dietary supplement based on this? So it's a very easy read, but it will keep you up to date on the current and the historically relevant research that literally has brought us to where we're at today as we try to work with bodybuilders and and optimize physiques. Mm, Amazing, amazing, amazing. I'm excited to see it. Well, I have this first issue in front of me right here. And after skimming through or reading through, I'm going to dive deeper into it. Um, Of course, it looks great. And I think um, an important point you made was having that practical 
application tagged along to the summary of these studies because I feel like oftentimes, you know, with many research reviews, it's either, you know, too focused on the latest and greatest that's coming out or, you know, it's too focused on the mechanisms of things and it often misses a big practical application as to like, okay, how do I integrate this information in my life so I could, you know, um, not take this, you know, one size fit all cookie cutter based approach and, you know, how do I find the lines within these guidelines that still get me the results that I want. So I think that's great. And um, going off into the first issue, uh, would you be interested in diving into some of the some of the findings? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. let's do it. So, and let me add, if you go to my website, BillCampbellPhD.com, you can download the issue that that we're going to talk about. You can download it for free. See if it's something that you like and that that it, if it brings you value. If it does, then I would be. Um, just happy if you were to subscribe um, for the subsequent issues. So again, it'll come out every month. But what you're, what we're going to talk about now is the kind of the template for what every month will look like. Amazing, amazing. So with this first study, is there an ideal protein distribution throughout the day to maximize muscle mass? Okay, so um, it seems like there were two groups of subjects in this first study, and I'll let you take the floor. Yeah, so two groups, and again, I, I don't. Hopefully, you can appreciate. You don't have to know how to read research. Reading research is difficult. I went to school for many years to learn how to understand it, the statistics, the methods. You don't have to do that. That's my job with this. So don't feel intimidated. Get get the free issues just and let me prove that to you. So they had two groups in the study. They had a traditional American group or Western diet group where we tend to skew our protein towards dinner. And what that means is there's very low protein intake at breakfast. There's a bit more at lunch. And then the bulk of our protein is at is 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 at night with with our dinner. So that was the traditional or the protein skewed group. The other group, they said, we're going to more evenly distribute the protein throughout the day. So we get an even, a, a more even amount at breakfast. So much more at breakfast, moderate amount at lunch and a moderate amount at dinner. So this was evenly distributed protein throughout the day. They had all of these subjects resistance training and they measured their gains in muscle mass throughout the study. And up until this point, we didn't have data in lifting subjects with protein feeding distribution. What we've had is some cellular data that does suggest spreading out your protein feeding seems to be more beneficial, seems to optimize the muscle protein synthetic response. But we did not have an, a, a chronic resistance training study until now. And what they found, the researchers found, was when you increase protein in the morning at lunch and dinner compared to, again, the skewing where you don't have much at all for breakfast and the bulk of your protein at dinner, you gain more muscle mass when you evenly, more even, again, it wasn't a, it wasn't a perfectly distributed protein, but by having a moderate amount of breakfast, a moderate amount at lunch and a moderate amount at dinner, they gain more muscle mass than the group that had all of it skewed towards later in the day. And what this did was it validated the cellular data that we have looking at the same concept. Mm. Mm. Great points, great points. And yeah, I think it's an absolutely great study. I mean, we only really know about, you know, our our background understanding of the mechanistic uh, response between muscle protein synthesis, muscle protein breakdown, and how we have to stimulate that throughout the day. But um, it is important to know that it's in conjunction of, uh, with resistance training and resistance training alone, you know, does provide us a uh, response with muscle protein synthesis up to 48 hours. Um, so providing that synergistic response will allow us to maximize uh, our, our rate that we're synthesizing amino acids. So as a practical application, is there anything that you'd like to add on to the findings of these studies or this study specifically? Yeah, I think 
what I liked about the experts that I brought in for this, so they were Lauren Conlon and Paul Revelia. So they're, they are both Tampa-based physique coaches, lifestyle coaches. And again, their job was, here's the study. How do you apply this? Give us some scenarios. And th thinking of what Paul Revelia, what, what he did was he gave us example of like a sedentary obese male just starting his program. Then there was a mom who's fairly fit, but she wants to get a little... You know, she's, you know, somewhat serious about her training. And then he gave like a, a very competitive bikini competitor. And he gave examples of how you would take a different approach with all of them. Kind of like, you know, being a little bit more lenient with somebody just entering the fitness space. Whereas with the bikini competitor, it was more on a schedule. Eat this time, this time, this time. Because obviously mm. when you're stepping on stage, you've got to have everything dialed in to, 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 have the best product, which is your body on that day. And then if I'm remembering what Lauren said, I, I appreciate what she said. Yes, we have protein goals, but just let, let the study guide us. You don't have to necessarily, if, uh, let me phrase it like this. If, if somebody's ultimate goal is 150 grams of protein per day, and we want to evenly distribute that. So 50 for breakfast, 50 for lunch, 50 for dinner. But this person comes to us eating, let's say, none for breakfast, 30 for, for lunch, and let's say 50 for dinner. So they're getting half as much as they need throughout the day. Instead of saying, you have to get 50 breakfast, 50 lunch, 50 dinner, meet them halfway. Say, hey, could you add some type of protein feeding for breakfast? Maybe it would be high protein milk. Maybe it would, maybe it would be a protein bar, maybe some eggs, whatever it is. Try to just meet them. They don't have to be perfect, but with, with your coaching, they're going to be better. You're, you're drawing them closer to the perfect protein feeding frequency window than what they would otherwise do on their own. So that I think Lauren did a good job of, of stressing that point. It's not about making them perfect. It's about you as a coach making them better than they would be if you didn't have you as a coach in their life helping them. Mm. Mm. That's a great perspective. That's a great perspective. And um, I think it's just important to go back to what we originally said is starting with the lowest hanging fruit and obviously individualizing the approach based on your demographic. Um, obviously, for a general population based individual, it has less of an importance, whereas for a competitor, it has a higher importance. And Generally, for most of my clients, for myself, I like to ensure that I'm maximally stimulating MPS with my first meal of the day because essentially we're in a fasted state when we're sleeping. So that, that big protein feeding uh, honestly just sets me up for success for the day from a satiation perspective. And also it's a great way to head into my training session to ensure that we're creating that quote unquote physiological anabolic environment going into our training session. So would you say there's any caveats to this with regards to protein uh, quality and quantity in meals, let's say, for example, for a plant-based eater, as there's going to be a difference with regards to, you know, loosing content in that protein feeding? Yeah, for somebody that's not going to choose or consume the highest quality sources of protein, which are animal sources of protein, they simply just have to take more of the non-high quality, the vegetable sources of protein at each feeding. So it really comes down to, to being that simple. I think years ago, a lot of people in, in our space would say you, you really shouldn't consume plant protein. Now I think we, we realize as long as you get the leucine content up, which you know is, is, is the amino acid that's primarily, primarily responsible for initiating muscle protein synthesis, and as long as you have enough of the essential and even non-essential amino acids to drive the muscle protein synthetic response, you're going to get the same adaptation. So you may need 25 grams of whey protein to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Maybe you need 34 grams of pea protein to do the same thing. So I think it's just an appreciation that you're going to need more of an inferior source. And when I say inferior, 
when ones that lack the same number of essential amino acids. Mm, mm, great point. Great point. And um, going into another route with the second study, does eating processed foods make it more difficult to optimize your physique? And um, I'll go ahead and let you take the floor with diving into the study and the outcomes. All right. Hold on. I'm going to get something real quick. So here's my process. Oh, wow. So I like processed foods. I like cookies. I like potato chips. I like ice cream. So the study, I love this study. It was so well designed. The study reinforced what I already know. So the study didn't teach me anything different, but what it, what it did was for the first time, we didn't have data on this. There has never been a study like this one where they, well, I won't tell you, I won't let the cat out of the bag yet. So let's talk about what they did. What they did was they had people live in a metabolic ward, let's just say like a dormitory for a month. And they had them follow two different diets. Two weeks, they followed a, an ultra processed food diet. A lot of this kind of stuff. During another two weeks, they had them followed a non-processed food diet. So the same subjects did both. Half of them started with ultra processed foods and they ended with unprocessed foods. The other half started with unprocessed and then they finished with ultra processed to make sure there was no time effect. The other thing that the researchers did, which was incredible, they matched the meals so that they were the same calories, the same protein, the same carbs, fat. Like that's very hard to do when you're mixing and matching process, ultra processed foods with unprocessed foods. So what they did was they handed them a meal at breakfast, lunch, dinner, same calories. But what made it different was they could eat as much of that meal as they wanted, or they could eat as little as they wanted. So sometimes they probably said, hey, I don't want to eat this. I'm full. They gave it back. Other times they said, hey, I'll take more. And they also were allowed to snack. So they had ultra processed, like this was actually some of the, the, this would be the snacks that they gave in the ultra processed food diet. And what they determined was they measured two things. They measured body composition. Let's just mainly focus on body weight. And then the other thing uh, was levels of hunger. And what they found at the end of the month was the subjects, when they were eating an ultra processed food diet, they actually ate 500 more calories per day on average, or approximately 500 more per day. That led to an increase in body weight. I'm trying to remember, I think it was about two pounds of weight increase over this two week period. And the unprocessed food group, no weight gain, may have even lost a little bit of weight. And they, had, they, they ingested 500 calories fewer. What, what kind of threw me for a loop in this study was when they measured hunger, there was no difference in the hunger scores. And I'm thinking, that's weird. And again, it'll make sense in a moment, but I'm like, that's weird. I always thought that eating highly processed foods made you more hungry. Like, and then it dawned on me. Well, yeah, it did. The reason that they were the reason that their hunger scores weren't elevated was because they had to eat 500 more calories every day to get to the same level of fullness. So it makes sense when you look at the calories and the hunger levels. So they were they didn't weren't any more hungry, but it took approximately 500 more calories per day to not feel any more hungry. So the study at the end of the day says what I think we all know. You can eat processed foods, but if you do, especially when you're dieting, you're making your process more difficult. You're going to be more hungry. It's, it's going to be easier to consume a lot more calories when you're eating ultra processed foods. Mm. That's a great point. That's a great point. And um, that reminds me of one of the foundational pillars that I like to educate my clients on, which is just adhering to the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of what you should be consuming should be coming. Then there's no rule, of course. There's no you should or you shouldn't, but it's just rather the smarter option from a satiation perspective, 
from a nutrient quality perspective. Um, and then we could also dive into like the nuances, like the thermic effect of feeding, you're actually going to get the difference between um, two said foods. But, you know, the 80-20 rule, 80% of what you should be consuming should be coming from minimally processed, wholesome, micronutrient dense foods, whereas the other, other 20% could be allocated towards fun foods such as a serving of chips or some pop tarts like you have on the cover here and um that's a great point i think oftentimes people could get caught into the misconception of thinking they're bad foods or good foods especially because it's processed or you know bread is the devil um, all these different misconceptions that i used to have when i first started out so it's understandable it's just you know, a level of education and realization that people have to come to within their own journey. And although the study was done in a metabolic ward, are there any limitations for the study being conducted in a metabolic ward? Yeah, I mean, one thing is, and again, they did, I think they had a vending machine where they could get a lot of their snacks, but obviously you're not driving by a Taco Bell in the metabolic ward. So you are artificially limiting some of the temptations that that naturally happen when you're when you're free living versus confined. But in this study, the fact that they were able to measure like every gram of food that went into their bodies, they monitored that you can't do that in a free living study. So you get more control with this but you lose some of the free living temptations and things that may derail somebody's uh, diet um, with this type of study. So you gain some things and you lose some things. Mm, mm, great point, great point. And this poses an uh, interesting question as to, you know, on the second study, we have, you know, an overfeeding of ultra processed foods that are, you know, uh, greater proportion of carbohydrate to fat versus study one, it's, you know, a higher protein based um, study. So would there potentially be an application with a higher protein intake to prevent overfeeding of, you know, carbohydrates and fats? Yeah, I believe so. Um, now, this study would not validate that, but um we have other research to suggest that protein is the most satiating nutrient. Um, and if you, again, if you're going to parlay that to the other study, if you eat pro higher protein for breakfast, lunch, dinner, you're constantly giving yourself the one nutrient that some research reports as being the most filling. So uh, now I, we also need to admit there's some research saying that protein is not more filling, but it's either always more filling, more satiating, or it's or at least as good as carbs and fats. It's never worse. So that's when you take the entire body of evidence with protein. Um, and then the other thing that the study lacked was like resistance training. The subjects weren't doing any resistance training. I can't remember if they had them do a little bit of walking exercise or uh, just a, a, a modest amount of, of step exercise. I, I'd have to refresh myself um, with, with the study. But yeah, I mean, protein, obviously, it would, would, would be a variable that our world would, would, would be relevant. And then, of course, resistance training as well. What does that do to appetite or exercise in general? Mm, great points. Great points. Um, and I think it's, it's also interesting um, that, like, you know, oftentimes amount when you go out to eat, amount of protein in a given meal is like relatively low. So, uh, and I know that rates of obesity is climbing and, you know, that just goes to show, I mean, like switching to a higher protein intake is the easiest and quickest way to make improvements in your body composition without a doubt. And then obviously, you know, maybe walking more and, you know, maybe resistance training consistently, all these different things that, uh, you have ability to implement to change your physique. So to close this off, Dr. Campbell, I want to thank you for coming on and diving into these studies with us. Is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with, maybe dates for the next issue? Yeah, so uh, I would just ask, go to my website, download the free issue, the inaugural issue. Um, again, looking at protein distribution and processed food diets. My website is billcampbellphd.com. 
And if you do subscribe, um, my intention is to have kind of what I call student-based pricing for everyone. So I, I, I would like this. My, my goal is that every fitness professional would have access to this. So I'm, I'm, I'm pricing this at $6.99 per month for, the, for, for a period of time. Now, after a few weeks, I will raise the price um, after my launch phase is over. But yeah, get just download the first issue for free. See if it's something that you think, yeah, I think this would help me be a better fitness professional or this would help me in my own resistance training programming or my how I approach dieting myself. Mm. Amazing. Go download the first issue team. Go give them a follow. Show them some love. Dr. Campbell, thank you again for your time and we'll talk soon. Thank you.